enemies can't ever catch your player and not predicting where they're going to move. In this video, we're going to take a look at how we can set an intercept course for a nav mesh agent when they're following a player by projecting the player's position forward by some time. This allows us to have much more realistic enemy chasing where they're not just always chasing and lagging behind the player a little bit. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy. Here to help you. Who? Me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become reality by helping your AI plot a course to intercept your player. Now, most tutorials that we see when we're talking about chasing a player do exactly the same thing. Even mine does this of setting the destination to the player's exact location. If you scale this up and just kind of see how that works in your real game, you find out that the chasing isn't the best. You can work around a lot of these by like having intelligent spawning or maybe not intelligent, but just random spawning all over your level. And with the agents coming all from different directions, they still kind of catch the player a little bit. What we can do is something really similar to what we did when we were picking a forward position whenever we're going to throw a projectile at a player. Take a list of historical velocities of the player over some time, pick some time in the future based on those previous velocities, say in one second, if they keep doing kind of their average over the last one second, you're going to be here and set the position to there instead of the player's current position. If you don't also check if you're maybe running in front of the player, then your AI will just run in front of the player all the time and that looks really dumb. So we need to do a little bit of math afterwards to find out if we're in front of the player and we're just constantly running in front of them. And if so, turn around and you know look at the player start attacking them whatever they need to do we're going to focus this one on how can we get that historical velocity and use that in the enemy movement to project the path forward i'm going to assume that you already know how to like spawn agents have them move around set destinations all those kinds of things if you don't know how to do that i've got 43 other videos in the ai series so far talking about enemy chasing setting positions all kinds of stuff about pathfinding ai navigation that kind of stuff we have an enemy movement class that just does move to player, setting the destination to the player's current position. Let's open up the player movement script, which isn't technically handling moving. You'd probably have something else. Actually, I have a totally different script from the starter asset that's handling movement. But the key thing that we want to get here is we want to be able to have a property that returns us the average velocity of the player over some time. We'll disallow multiple components and require a type of character controller. This also works with rigid body and nav mesh agent movement. This just happens to be the starter assets is using character controller. We'll add a private character controller controller and two private serialized fields, a historical position duration that will set to 1f by default and clamp it with a range from 0.1 to 5. If we have a lower duration, we have fewer points to compute when we're trying to get the average velocity. But also, if we have it too small, then it's basically the same as just taking the character controller's current velocity. So it introduces a lot of noise. The historical position interval, similarly, the smaller values will result in more data points, which will give us a more smooth velocity history. But if we set it too low, then there's too many points and it's really slow for us to compute this average. You can play with these and find out which works best for your game in terms of performance and accuracy. We're going to use a queue to store these historical velocities. We'll add a private float last position time to calculate when we should add new velocities to this queue and a private end max queue size that we're going to set based on our position duration and our position interval. On awake, we'll grab a reference to that character controller, calculate the max queue size with 1f divided by the historical position interval times the historical position duration, and we'll seal that to int. Finally, we'll set the historical velocities to be a new queue with a capacity of that max queue size. In update, we'll check if the last position time plus the historical position interval is less than or equal to the current time. If it is, we'll also check if the historical velocities count is equal to the max queue size. For some reason, I put greater than. I'm going to change that in just a second to equal to. We will dequeue a historical velocity to make sure we stay under that max queue size, and we will enqueue the current velocity from the controller. And again, if you're using a rigid body movement, you can do the exact same thing. And nav mesh agents, you can get their current velocity. So all of these, you do basically the same thing. So now we have a list of historical velocities. We need to compute the average. We're going to make a public vector three average velocity with a getter. In there, we'll set a vector three average to be vector three zero, iterate over all the historical velocities, summing the velocities into the average. We're going to set the y to be zero. You may not need to do this depending on how your level is set up. I would just play with that to see if it makes sense to include in your game or not. We'll then return the average divided by the historical velocities count. 
Now in our enemy movement, we can do something different based on the player's average velocity. At the top of enemy movement, we're gonna add in three new fields, private bool use movement prediction, a private float movement prediction threshold that will set to zero by default and have that be a range from negative one to one and a float movement prediction time set to one and we'll put a range of 0.25 to two on that one. I think the movement prediction threshold is only one that might be a little bit weird, so we'll talk about that whenever we get there. We'll just wrap our previous set destination going to the player's position if we're not gonna use movement prediction so we can see the difference between the two. And we might naively initially want to just set the destination to be the player's velocity times that movement prediction time and go. Let's see how that works. We can see in the scene view that now all the agents are choosing a point in front of the player and they start plotting an intercept course really, but some of them are also walking in front of my player. They're actually all trying to walk in front of my player. They just have agent avoidance on so they can't all get there. So that does work, but eventually they just run in front of the player and that looks kind of weird. What we're gonna do then is set the target position to exactly what we just did, the player transform position plus the average velocity times the movement prediction time. We're gonna calculate the direction from the agent to that point and also the direction from the agent to the player. This is gonna give us two vectors that are probably somewhat different. We're gonna calculate the dot product from the direction to the player to the direction to the target and compare that to that movement prediction threshold. That's why we put it as a range of negative one to one. We're gonna say if this dot product is less than this, we're gonna set the target position to be the player's current position. And then we're always gonna set the agent destination to the target position, which may have been set back to the player's actual position. Let's take a look at how that looks. Now the agents kind of walk in front of me and then decide that they're too far in front and come back setting their destination to my current position. It might look kind of weird because there's so many of them, so let's reduce the number of agents active. So we can tweak this number. I found for me 0.33 works pretty well. That gets them a little bit in front and then come back to you. Ideally, you'll have them like attack the player or something so you won't see this jitter happening like what we're seeing right here. They probably stop, start attacking, and then eventually start chasing again. So you can see a negative value doesn't really make sense here. The dot product's always zero or more. At anything less than zero, we will always have it run in the front. Even at zero, a lot of times it doesn't do the right thing. That's where I got the 0.33 value that works okay. It'll start getting in front and then come back. The higher you put this value, the less in front of the player the agent will go. Set it too small and it'll always go only to the player's location though. There are a lot of things we can do on top of this. For example, maybe we want to do a distance-based forward setting. So calculate how long does it take to get from where the agent is to the player's location and use that as an approximation for how far in front of the player we should project, maybe clamping it to this movement prediction time. Now we'll see many dots in front of the player of varying paths in front based on the distance from the agent to the player. So they all act a little bit differently. The farther away they are, the farther in front of the player they project. It makes it pretty hard to avoid them. The farther, like the tighter turns are not acceptable anymore, the, the agents will get me. Still, I can avoid them all, but it's significantly harder than it was before. We can clearly see these new agents picking much better future paths and it's a lot harder to get away from them. There's still some room for improvement because sometimes it's still I don't know, they're, they're still kind of robotic looking. Something I learned from one of the Doom GDC conferences is in some of the AI that they had, they would make them choose from different options. Whenever they were like gonna use a skill that had them leap or something, they would plot multiple different options and see which one they wanted, or they'd maybe pick a random one of the options available. You could do something similar here where instead of just setting the destination immediately, you could calculate some paths. So your AI feels like maybe they're a little bit smarter or they're doing more unexpected things. They're not all doing the exact same thing. The other thing to consider here is we're assuming that we have a very large playable area or at least a very large nav mesh where we can always set a destination some infinite distance away from the player. And that's not always true. Depending on how we tweak these parameters, you might have it where we're trying to set a destination that's way off the nav mesh and it ends up being slower the more times that we try to do that and the farther off the nav mesh we try to set the destination. There's a lot of different tweaks, optimizations and stuff you can do to come up with more natural feeling or more interesting AI behavior than everyone just kind of doing the exact same thing. If you got value out of this video, go ahead and like and subscribe to help the channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. This new video is posted every tutorial Tuesday and if you want to support this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash bombacademy, get your name up here on the screen, 
Get a shout out starting at the awesome tier. Speaking of those awesome supporters, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Rulin, Ifeopolis, and Paul Berry. And at the tremendous tier, there's Bruno Bozic. And at the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen and Andrew Albright. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.